Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence for the Playbook Experts YouTube channel as we're presenting our March Madness Extravaganza special podcast. We're going to cover everything from A to Z for the start of the March Madness tournament here with Andy Isco, our co-host, Jim Feist, live from Las Vegas. Tony Mejia, normally with us, will be off today. And our producer, Greg De Palma, will be going all over every question or thought you might have about the upcoming NCAA basketball tournament. And before we begin the festivities, I want to welcome into the show our good friend Jordan Reed from uwager.lv. You've heard me talk about uwager.lv all throughout the season. And with that, we decided to bring Jordan Reed on to tell you a little bit more about what uwager.lv has to offer to you throughout the tournament. Jordan, I know you've got your brackets all set and you're ready for the March Madness tournament. So, too, I guess, is everybody at uwager.lv. Yeah, thanks for having me on. We're very excited. March Madness is a super fun time of year. We got our brackets up for everybody to play in. You got to get in before the, the first game here on Thursday. So um, come on down. Let me ask you this, Jordan. Uh, how long has you wager been in business as a sports book? I was really, really, really excited about you wager uh, LV. I know you guys do a lot of work with us in our playbook preview guide magazine our weekly newsletters and everything but i really love the way you run your operation there how long has you wager been in business as a sports book you wager's been around for a really long time they've been uh since 1998 actually started up here in costa rica one of the oldest uh sports books well wow, really nice that's a lo- longevity says a lot especially in this world of sports books today and if uh one of our customers would ask you jordan they would say what are some of the advantages you're going to offer to me that aren't offered at other sports books. What can you give me at uwager.lv? Well, we just had baseball start up. We've got a true dime line in baseball. So if you're interested in the best lines and line value, uh, we've got that. Uh, we offer a 5% monthly rebate. That's free for our active players. So you'll get that on all of your net losses. Uh, if you happen to have a bad month, it helps you turn things around. We also have really big bonuses and uh, 24-7 customer service and wagering. So you can call in any time. That's really nice. I know throughout the course of our football podcast, we had called out the fact that every Friday was minus 105 juice at you wager. That's all during the football season. So mark that down when the football season does roll around. And believe me, you'll blink your eye and football is going to be here before you know it. You'll have that benefit as well at minus 105 juice every Friday at uwager.lv. So, Jordan, let me ask you this. I know you're you're prepared. You're all psyched up for this basketball tournament, as is all of America, filling out all their brackets and everything and so forth and whatnot. What is, one simple question, the number one reason that our listeners to this podcast should contact you now for March Madness? Oh, it's hard to boil it down to just one reason, you know. Uh, we really do feel like we offer the best product in the sportsbook industry, and that's for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we have a really loyal customer base that keep coming back to us, and that's because uh, the lines are really strong. We offer a bunch of free competitions and things. Our brackets are going on are going on right now. That's a free chance to win. Well, ten million dollars is a, is the ultimate, uh, but. Um, the top 30 prize spots are paid on that. So that's always fun to play in and it's exciting. It's a good time. Well, tell me also Jordan about the monthly 5% rebates that you offer to your customers, uh, the 5% rebates and the free same day payouts that are available at uwager.lv as well. Yeah, we do have free same day payouts. We pride ourselves on that because the most important thing about betting is getting paid, right? We don't slow people. We don't delay them. The money comes out of your account as soon as you request it and gets sent to you. And we do that seven days a week. And so people really like that. Um, And then as far as the 5% monthly rebates go, those are for our active players. So if you have four weeks of action in a month, you're going to get that completely for free. And we'll give you back 5% of your losses after every month. And that's on top of a bunch of other programs. We we have uh, casino and poker as well. You get daily casino rebates. Uh, you can get the daily casino rebates and also get the 5% monthly rebate on top of that if you're into casino. Uh, just a lot of different promotions and bonuses all the time. It sounds like a lot of good things going on at uwager.lv these days. uwager.lv, the only sports book that I, Mark Lawrence, personally endorse. I invite our listeners out there to check them out. Call them toll free at 1 800 U Wager or log on at uwager.lv. And with that, Jordan, I'm going to let you run and get your brackets all filled out for this upcoming NCAA basketball tournament. I hope you got a few sleeper picks 
that will carry you a long, long way. Too much chalk in these basketball turns for me personally, but I'm a big dog guy anyway. So best of luck to you and everybody at uwager.lv throughout the March Madness tournaments. All right. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. And, uh, yeah, sleepers, NC State, Texas A&M. There we go. Pick those. A&M and NC State. I'm going to mark that down. I'm going to even hold you to it, Jordan, okay? <laughs> Please do. Thank you for having me on. All right. Thank you. That was Jordan Reed joining us from uwager.lv, the only offshore sports book that I, Mark Lawrence, personally endorse. And I invite you to open up your account at uwager.lv to take advantage of all the bonuses they offer just in time for the March Madness NCAA basketball tournament. And with that, I want to welcome in our panel, our regular panel of experts here, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, the living legend himself, Jim Feist from Las Vegas, and our producer, Greg De Palma, as we're all set for March Madness, guys. And uh, I want to ask you guys about March Madness here. There's a ton of things. We could probably do a three-hour podcast if we really wanted to. But uh, the truth of the matter is... Uh, that's if we wanted to keep it short. It, well, that's a, <laughs> you're probably right on in that, Andy. I'm sure you are. <laughs> remember our lunch. And also remember the fact that uh, I'd have to be jumping up and down to go to the men's room a couple, two or three times uh, if we did a three-hour podcast as well. So we'll see if we can get this inside and keep it nice and comfort, comfortable for everybody, yours truly as well. Uh, when, the, when the brackets come out, guys, there's a lot of teams that uh, ultimately end up being seated uh, perhaps to me a little bit better than perhaps they thought they would be or a little bit worse than they thought they would be. Uh, Andy, I'm going to start with you first and ask you who you thought some of the winners and losers as far as the seating in the March Madness tournament bracket ended up being. Well, one of the thoughts that I have just in a general overall about the bracket is uh, that the Mountain West had six teams make the tournament. The Big East had only three. And I, I wonder if they're trying to tell us that they think the Mountain West is better than the Big East, but I think the three, the the, the, <laughs> the fourth, fifth, and sixth teams in the Big East, and let's say for argument's sake, St. John's, Seton Hall, and Providence, would probably, if they played the, the six teams in the tournament from the Mountain West, th those three teams, number four, five, and six in the Big East, would probably have an overall winning record against uh, the uh, the 16 from the Mountain West Conference. They might struggle a little bit with a couple of them, but I think overall those three teams would do well against the entire six or certainly the bottom three in the uh, Mountain West. So I thought that the um, Big East uh, did not get the kind of respect that it deserved for a number of reasons. Go back to Blue Ribbon Yearbook, uh, one of the, the maybe the most respected preseason publications. Yes, right. They had UConn, Marquette, and Creighton as three of the top nine teams for the season turned out to be correct that those three teams are seated one two and three UConn Marquette and um, Creighton now what that suggests also is that they were so expected to be so dominant the Big East that the rest of the league would not have the kind of records because they'd all be taking turns losing to those top three teams and I think that the committee did not take into account that fact that the that the conference was so strong at the top was expected to be strong at the top and played out that way as opposed to, for example, the Mountain West, where there really was, A, no real preseason threat. Maybe San Diego State, because of their uh, their history and the fact that they made the Final Four, in fact, made the final game against UConn last year, but there was really no teams at the really top. So it suggested that it may be a well-balanced conference, and because of that, they scored well in a lot of those net rankings, which I, Rick Pitino and I agree. <laughs> Pretty worthless when you consider all the flaws that are in there that work against the mid-majors and especially you know many of those small conference teams. So I thought that was one of the uh, glaring things. I thought as far as being underseeded in the tournament, I thought Auburn should have been at worst, a number three seed and more likely a number two seed. When you compare their resume, when you compare their rankings, and the Bartorvik, the uh, Ken Palm, even in the own NCAA committee uh, statistics that they analyze, they are ranked usually fourth or fifth in most of the key categories, including offensive and defensive uh, efficiency rankings, maybe a little bit lower. I think, I think they are one of just a handful of teams who rank, I think, in the top 15 or 20 in each offense and defense. And they played 
a lot of people say the Big 12 was the best conference. I will say if they were, it wasn't by much over the SEC, which I think had one of their best seasons and deepest seasons in years. Yeah, there was a horrible Missouri and bad Vanderbilt, and even an Arkansas team was really disappointed. But you take a look at the top six or seven teams in that conference, and uh, they were extremely competitive, even in uh, many of those losses that they had to one another. So I thought Auburn sort of was a little bit uh, underseeded. Uh, as far as overseeding, I guess that's sort of really a topic for which teams we think should have made the tournament as opposed to uh, those that perhaps got snubbed. Yeah, I guess it's be like beauty, and it's all in the eye of the beholder as far as uh, that goes. And I hear what you're saying about Auburn, a basketball team that I know a lot of people really think have a good chance to perhaps be one of those number four seeds that crash the party and actually win the tournament this year. Jim, Andy brings up a good point about uh, the Big East only getting three seeds in the tournament, albeit number one, number two, and number three seeds. But what does that say about the rest of the Big East Conference? Was it just watered down and these three teams were actually head and shoulders above everybody else? Or do you feel that some teams in the Big East were lighted in this meeting? Well, a lot of this, um, this the committees for years, is all it comes down to politics. Yes. Um, and and so, so some of this we have to take with a grain of salt just because the committee says something about a team and they put them in. I mean, for example... How bad the selection could have Virginia been? I mean, it was horrible. And there were like probably six teams that deserved to get in over Virginia, and then Virginia slips in. Why? Well, they're a former winner. They got the political stuff. It's Virginia. You know, it's a classic school. Um, it's a lot of politics. It's it's a dirty game. It's it's not always fair. If you went by the net or the Ken Palm, or Virginia wouldn't have been there. And there's other teams that would have been, um, you know, you St. John's, for example, coming on strong, Rick Pitino, uh, Indiana State. There's there's a lot of teams that, that I would rather see playing than Virginia. And there's other teams that got in that shouldn't be in as well. And then we have this issue where, the, you know, the best teams in the league don't make it because they lose the conference tournament, which is in excuse my French, is bullshit. So <laughs> why, play, why, play the, why play the whole year when you, all you have to do is win those last few games in the tournament to get in? It, you know, that's, that's kind of a silly, silly example. But it's, it's a bad situation, probably won't improve until, um, well, I don't, I don't know when it'll improve. <laughs> it never will. Well, the only thing that they're thinking about doing, which I'm completely against, is adding even more teams. Um, because that would be an answer to, say, five teams that got knocked out because of uh, bid stealing conference, postseason conference tournaments. But when you're talking about 68 teams already, I, I you know, if you can't be one of the top 64, then why are you complaining that you're, you know, 69? I mean, it's well, it's it's Greg, ridiculous. I think what it comes to, it comes down to, uh, excuse me, but it's not about that. It's about Money. it's it's about who has proven they're the best team. I mean, can you really say that these number one teams that got knocked out in these mid, mid, middle middle? Uh, oh, you're talking about like South Florida. Yeah, yeah, these teams that did. I have no in. problem with that. I agree 100%. Those teams deserve to be in because they were clearly. What did that team have? Like a 15, 18, 20 game winning streak? And then they lose one game and they're out. They're done. I have no problem with that. Well, that's. I, I, I want to hear the moronic reason that Virginia got in. Yeah. I want to hear that from some intelligent being. That 100% agree. Maybe hey, Jim, I'll, I'll give you the moronic reason that Virginia uh, <laughs> just stunk up the joint in the play-in game. I heard an interesting theory just before the podcast began, and uh, maybe it's an excuse. You know, perhaps it would be, and maybe I'm touting Virginia because I happened to like Virginia in that game last night and ended up a red face because of it, because I did like the pedigree in the basketball game, and I liked their defense, but they forgot to bring an offense. They were just throwing up bricks. Uh one of the reasons perhaps they were throwing up bricks, somebody uh, alluded to the fact that uh, all basketballs that are being used in this NCAA tournament are being uh, supplied by Wilson. And the basketballs that uh, Virginia, and I believe it's the ACC as a whole, played with were Nike basketballs all season long. 
And you ask the players, and the players will say to a man that the biggest difference between the Wilson basketball and the Nike basketball is that the uh, Wilson basketballs are a lot stickier than the Nike basketballs were. And to a team that has a trouble finding the hole, as they, as Virginia does, it probably didn't help their case any none whatsoever in a situation like that. But it leads me also to the point that if that is indeed the case, that these basketballs are all different for a reason, should does it warrant us going out and finding out which teams played with Wilson basketballs and which ones played with Nike basketballs? Is that a concrete it, question? It probably does, but also at the same time, unless this is the first year that they made this switch, they would have played with them in past tournaments as well, even though using the Nike uh, during the season. But more importantly, I, 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 I'm i hoping that they weren't just surprised and they had several days' notice of what the basketballs were going to be, that they would have been able to practice for at least three or four uh, days, because that would have made sense considering if the players are making that comment, it had to be something that basically anybody comparing the two basketballs would have noticed. And the other side of the coin is uh, the, uh, the team that drubbed Virginia last day. What kind of basketball were they using all season long as well? So, you know, the, the truth of the matter is you still have to go out and beat your opponent. And when you're, when you're young growing up and you're playing basketball on outside of uh, cement courts, <laughs> you're not analyzing the basketball that you're using. You're just trying to play basketball and um, fill the hole is what you're trying to do. I think what's going to ultimately be a solution, and it's headed in the direction – Ultimately, and I don't know what it'll do to the conference tournaments, they make everybody eligible. You go from, go take out the first four. You go from 64 to 128, so that's an extra round. 128 to 256, that's an extra, extra round, so that's an extra two days. And what you would do is you would give like the top 50 or 60 or 90, whatever the number that you need is depending upon the number of teams. There are 362 right now, uh, ignoring any teams that might be on probation and not eligible. You give them buys for that opening round to re to, to reduce the... It's like you'd have uh, the buys and then you'd start the field after that first round of 256. Uh, you would have 256 teams playing the tournament Whoa! as the other teams would get involved. Holy it would, it, would just, it would just be an extra two two to three days. I think Jim would, Jim likes that idea. <laughs> the more I think all bettors would like that idea. The, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> give, me, give me more shots of winning. Uh, I'll take it. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I sort of say it half jestingly because it's, it's not likely, but it is something that is workable. And again, it's all about money. And think about the ratings would be. Yeah. Now, you would. a lot of the top teams would not play in the buy round. So you're not looking at like 50 point uh, point spreads. You might be looking at when you get to the final, you know, the field gets trimmed to 256. You still might be looking at 30 point spreads, but then you get down another round and then you get to our more reasonable point spreads as the really non-deserving teams are eliminated. And that might just be a way to, well, then all the griping will be, a, which teams deserve buys that didn't get them, and B, the seedings would be more of an issue. But at least everybody can say we had our chance. Well, Andy, I think you're on to something there because, uh, as Greg mentioned, teams like USF, South Florida, definitely belong in this tournament. Uh, and because of one loss politically, as Jim referred to, the fact that they lost in their conference tournament at an inopportune time, they don't get a bid here, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, and I also think, Andy, you're on the right, you're on the right path here in that – it's inevitable that the NCAA basketball term is going to grow. It's going to expand. And if for no other reason, because we live in this world today of money talks. And that's what the NCAA basketball tournament is all about. It's all about by the, the money. By the way, yeah. one other comment that relates back Absolutely. to the first question. And that is about the seeding and deserving teams. What has the committee, the selection committee, have against the state of Colorado, making both Colorado and Colorado State be in the play-in games, despite the fact that they were seeded number 10s, and usually these games are between number 11s? Because they were the first state to legalize weed, I guess that might be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they have against Colorado, Andy. Well, uh... pardon the pun, but if, that, if that's true, maybe they sh their seed should have been improved. That should have been. <laughs> hey, Greg, let me ask you this question. We're talking a little bit about winners and losers here and the guys that come out of the seating here in either pretty good shape or not so good shape. Uh, one of the guys I think on my list of a team that I think was fortuitous in their in, in their seed was Kentucky. And maybe it's a reach on my part. Uh, the, I thought the Wildcats would be more like a four seed, you know, possibly a five seed, but uh, more like a four seed, but yet they were seated number three. Do you think that's a verified justifiable seed for Kentucky at number three? Uh, yeah. I mean, 
it's I think that when you take first of all, if we take a look at uh, let's compare the, the other uh, three seeds. So you have Creighton. Uh, who else? You have a three seed on the Baylor. Other Baylor and, and uh, Iowa State. No, Iowa State's a two seed. I was a two. Auburn's a four. Uh, Washington State are they a three? Let's see other three. Mm-hmm. You know what I hate? I don't know if you guys have this problem, but every year. It doesn't matter how what site this has been going Illinois. on. Illinois, Illinois. Illinois yeah. This has been going on for like I don't know for as long as I've been printing out brackets. I can't for the life of me get a bracket to print out exactly the way it looks on the screen. It's always it's it's always cutting off something on the bracket. Like, like that's why I couldn't see it because I got the whole seeds on one side. I can't see. I got everything else, and I know it's a silly uh, complaint. But I just think a lot of other people must be having the same issues. It, it's I a very oh, exactly. You need you need a magnifying glass to read the uh, sixty four teams that initially. Oh made yeah. Them. Well, h- here's the fix to that, Greg. We just uh, we were in my office this morning. And we were printing out brackets, and we ran into the same problem. And what we found out the thing to do is today, when you copy a link and you go to paste it and send it somewhere, it doesn't just send the link. It sends a photograph of what that was all about. And then you're supposed to click on the photograph and it's supposed to open. But the problem is it doesn't open. It opens to whatever size it determines it wants to send it out as. But if you take that link that you're sending, and in the upper right-hand corner of that link, there's a drop-down box, and it'll say print as a link rather than as a PDF. If you open it up and click on the print as a link, it will open it up to true size. Interesting. So, so I'll that's, have to check that out. <laughs> yeah, right. everybody can use one. Uh, yes. But getting to your point, look, I think the thing with Kentucky, and I think everybody sees this, and we've been we've been uh, suckered into this Kentucky deal for quite a, a number of years, um, and, and that is is that uh, they have all these great athletes, these great NBA prospects, but it's always you know every year it's like the entire team is different because he has so many freshmen and sophomore sophomores that come in and McDonald's All Americans and top five recruits and they're all uh, top uh, five star recruits and they're off to the NBA. Some of that hasn't been working recently, but this year it has. And because of that, uh, I think they're looking at Kentucky a little bit. Uh, I think they're upgrading them myself a little bit more than I think they should be uh, because they don't play any defense. I think we just really lost to Texas A&M, I believe which is a pretty decent SEC team. But still, I think that this is a team that is probably one of the more overrated teams in the tournament. That's just my opinion, and I don't I, think I they're think, going very far. Well, just about just about every team in the tournament has a flaw. Or, and Absolutely, some them, yes. Some of them several. That's, that's why you look at this. And to me, when I look at this, I said, the team that's the most consistently who I think they are when they go on the floor with the best coach or at least a quality coach is Connecticut. I don't, I don't, I don't see why anybody could look beyond Connecticut and say anyone is, they may be more talented, but how out of a hundred games or out of, let's say 10 games, keep it simple. Who's going to show up being who they really are playing to their ability and making good decisions throughout the game more often than not. It's kind of the way we looked at the Super Bowl when we looked at the different coaches and the running backs and the quarterbacks and the coaches. You know, you break it down by points. Connecticut checks off all the boxes. I, I think another flaw with the committee, and they used to place more emphasis on recent form, the last 10, the last 15 games. They don't do that anymore. That's not one of the top criteria that they have. They look at the season body of work. To a certain extent, it made sense back in the day, but considering the current environment of college basketball with the por- the transfer portal, the NIL issues, etc. Teams look completely different from one year to the next. And so teams that are good, it used to be the team you see in November and December is not the team you see in February and March. Well, that's true, but it's even more true today because it takes maybe eight, 10 games in November, December for coaches, especially new coaches or coaches with a lot of turnover on the team, which is the majority of teams these days, it takes them uh, that many games to get things in order, figuring out the right combinations, the strengths and weaknesses, what uh, what they want to approach when conference play begins. That's why, I, that's why I think they need to return to placing more emphasis on performance down the stretch. Uh, St. John's, I think, is a perfect example. Uh, of a team that played extremely well down the stretch that in years right. past probably would have made the tournament. And, of course, Patino did have a good point with his net ranking B. I, I think he his team was the highest-ranked 
according to the net for the few years that they've been using it, that did not make the tournament as an at-large team, even though several teams uh, with with weaker nets did make it. So I'm not. Uh, I like numbers, of course. But I think you also have to understand, and I think maybe the Mountain West was, I won't say guilty of it, but maybe they took advantage of it. They may have figured out how to deal with all the components of getting a good net ranking by how you schedule, where you schedule, just like teams were able to figure out in the old days of RPI, how you build your RPI. You get a lot of wins at home uh, against teams because your win teams, uh, your win percentage had a lot that was a major component of the RPI. It's almost like the, what the SEC did for years and continues to do in college football. They get criticized for scheduling, you know, uh, Podunk State in the middle of November when everybody else is playing a conference rival. Well, that team that, that Podunk State, or whoever you want to call it, would normally even played in September like most other teams. The problem is with that, what the SEC figured out, is that, well, in November, we may be, see, we may be ranked like fourth or fifth in the polls. Well, while we're playing a team that we're going to be favored by 30 points over and winning easily, the team may be ranked right ahead of us. It's going to be playing an arch rival or one of the good quality foes. And if they lose, we will jump them in the rankings. And the SEC did that uh, for years. And I think they still do it to a great extent. So I think anytime you devise a system, especially a mathematical one that goes into making decisions, there are going to be teams out there who find ways to exploit the vulnerabilities or the weaknesses in that system. Because as, for every system that has strengths, there are certain weaknesses that were, that were not considered or if they were considered, were neglected by the committee. Let me ask you guys this, uh, Greg, you in particular, uh, now we're talking about winners and losers from the seeding of this year's basketball tournament. And if you're North Carolina, I think you have to consider yourself a winner in that you landed the number one seed. But if you're Arizona, would you consider yourself a loser because you got a number two seed? Was it justified that Carolina is a one and Arizona is a two, in your opinion, Greg? Well, Arizona did lose uh, two of the last three. I think that might have had a, a, a bad effect on them, um, possibly. Uh, and let's remember, they didn't have a good – talking about politics, and they always say they don't look at what happened previous years or about a program's identity, but Arizona's identity last year was pretty bad in the tournament. So maybe that had something to do with it. North Carolina did go all the way to the championship game of their uh, tournament. They are North Carolina, uh, much uh, more well-known program. Um, as far as the, uh, the the regions, I think the most interesting one, without question, is the East, because oh. even even just in the top portion of the East, you've got the three out of the four Final Four teams making it back, which is just it, very interesting that UConn might have to beat both FAU and San Diego State just to get to the Elite Eight, uh, which uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before. Which, by the way, means the committee wanted to make sure that let's take two quality mid-major programs, put them in the region with the strongest number one overall seed so that we can have some more marquee programs in the Final Four this year. Doesn't mean it'll work, but I wouldn't be surprised. The committee says they don't realize this stuff, but they don't live you know, in a, uh, an isolated environment. They know all these things. And the, the problem, and again, I hate to keep ranting on this, and I did, I, by the way, thank you for your link, Greg. I haven't l listened to it yet from your last year's rant, but I would imagine it says basically something along the lines of the committee can justify any decision it makes because with every team they evaluate, there are strengths in their favor and strengths or weaknesses against them. And they are so inconsistent when you ask them sometimes, they'll take factors A, B, and C as a reason for including a team. And then when you look at uh, another team that uh, similar, reasons D, E, and F for excluding a team because their weaknesses, meanwhile, they may have the same positive characteristics of the team that they, accept, uh, that they accepted and offered a bit to. So they can basically justify any decision uh, they, uh, they make. And I, I, there are two issues that people have at the committee. The who, which teams make it in, which teams make it out, and the seating. And I think the teams in and out is much is a much more serious issue than where teams are seated. Because once you're seated, you, if you're going to win a title, you're going to have to beat five, six good teams in, to do it anyway, regardless of where you start. Well, that being the case, Jim, let me ask you this question uh, while we're on the subject here. Uh, a lot of what happens today is done with analytics. It's the world we live in. Uh, like it or not, it's uh, what is analyzed. That's where the net rankings come from and uh, everything like that. But do you feel that the committee still uses the eye test? Do they pass the eye test uh, that they were basically were doing with this tournament here in the 80s and 90s before all the analytics come into place? 
How important to you, Jim, is the eye test? I think it's very important. And, and the analytics uh, bother me to some extent. I agree that there's room because of computers and the speed of the computers and what people come up with, the different, different ratings on offense and defense and turnovers. And I mean, it used to be, look at the foul shooting, look at the turnovers, look at the percentage for shots from three point, two point. Uh, but now it's, it's broken down into so many different categories. The problem with using so many different numbers the good thing about basketball is they pay, play 30 games. So you can, the, the numbers have a little bit more value because they play 30 as opposed to in football when they play 11 or 12 in, in foot, college football. So there's more value there. In baseball, it may, means even greater because they're playing 162 regular season games. So numbers mean more the more you can put the stats. You, you have a bigger sample size. But I, I think I think they've lost track of the the eye test. I think that they look, and then when you talk about analytics, how much weight do you put on each category that you're looking at? Is is defensive rebounding worth a half a point or three points? Is you know offensive shooting three point shots? I mean, you take a three point shooting team that's averaging say forty points of 40 percentage points of a, a game three three point shots and then they come out and hit a 13 out of 40 you know i mean you have a game like that you're you're going home unless you have some kind of inside game offensive rebounding you know where you can get some of your own shots back and put them back in i mean there's so many different ways of looking at numbers but there's only one way to look at a game and how it's played and how does the left tackle do and the, the you know, the wide receivers, can he get separation? And, and I think we lose that. I think we, we depend. I mean, we had a, we had a head coach down the, uh, the Padres. They're not Padres, Chargers. Uh, Staley? Yes, Brandon Staley. Was so much, he was so much into analytics. I think a lot of us would sit there and pull our hair out. Yeah, the but game got passed him because of it, they, yes. It, it, you know, they, they, they ruined a really good team on paper. They, I mean, they had a lot of great talent. He, he didn't qualify as being there making those kind of decisions. He might be a back guy up in the booth guy that runs that game. You're 32% better off doing this than that and not the head coach. But he, he wasn't, he was out of his element. And I think a lot of people in this business today are out of their element because they forgot about what the hell's going on on the field. And they're just looking at a bunch of numbers. Yeah, let me, let me say something about the uh, the numbers because you bring up a good point with the 32 percent that they say. Well, it's nice to know that overall it's 32 percent, but you know what? For this one decision, it's either going to be zero percent or a hundred percent, and sometimes <laughs> that's where the uh, the instinct, the history, your your familiarity comes into play. When you take a look, for example, let's use Ken Palm ratings, okay? Ken Palm ratings are almost universally accepted uh, by the lines makers because if you look at the lines that come out for sides and totals, they are very, very close. Oh, now, very much. The, problem, the problem with with these ratings, okay, so you have to respect the lines maker because they're using respected numbers and people are going to follow them. But these, let's say, power ratings basically say, okay, if this team plays not its typical game, but its average game that they've established, and the other team plays its average game, this is what the result should be. The problem is that almost all the time, teams don't play their typical game as an average game. They may play better than their average game, they may play worse than their average game, and their typical game may not be an average, but the average is an average of all the games they played. So what you have to decide as a better is say, okay, in this matchup, is this team likely to play better than its average game and more like its typical game against this type of competition, or are they going to play um, considerably above or below that level? And that's where matchup analysis comes in, and that's often where the eye test comes in when you're looking at how teams match up against certain styles and certain opponents. So there are strengths in using numbers, and I've used them for 50 years, but I understand not just the strengths, but the weaknesses that are inherent based upon uh, the, the factors that go into determining those numbers. I know I go back to the days of uh, Jerry Tarkanian and the Robin Running Rebels from Vegas, and uh, they were a basketball team that, to me, always passed the eye test. You looked at that basketball yep. team, they looked so much bigger, so much faster, so much better than the other teams. You didn't even need to look at the stat sheet to find out what edges they had 
you know, defensive field goal percentage, rebounding, so forth and whatnot. You just sure. knew that it was one damn good basketball team. Damn, yeah. damn right. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, now is UConn one damn good basketball team? Probably. I mean, you know, they're defending champion. Are they going to get there again this year? I don't think so. Uh, if for no other reason, because it's been a long, long while between rinks of water of teams repeating, and they're going to also be the targeted team, but they're still one very good basketball team. Let, let me mention one thing with that, Mark, because if you go from the end of the UCLA dynasty, which ended, let's say, 1975, wouldn't yes. last year when they won like seven out of eight or six or whatever the number was, there have been almost 50 years since 1975. It's happened only twice that teams have been able to repeat. Duke in the early 90s and Florida yeah. in the mid-2000s. Now, uh, keep in mind, every year there's going to be a defending champion and it's easy, especially if they've had a good season, that that's going to be the team that everyone's going to say, will they be able to repeat? And they come up with many, many good reasons. And Connecticut is just the latest in such a long lines, and yet it's only happened twice. So I'm with you as far as thinking that that they won't. Largely, not largely because they can't, but because it is so difficult to, to repeat. They had the target on their backs all, every game this season, but more importantly in the tournament, teams are going to be giving them, you would think, their best opportunity, and can you survive a, a six-game stretch where everything goes your way? Yeah, you can win the first two games pretty easily, unless you're like a number one seed like a Purdue was last year in the Virginia uh, six years earlier, or five years or whatever it was. Uh, but for the most part, once you get into the Sweet 16, you are facing... I would say of the remaining four games that you will have to play somewhere along the line, because it may not be round by round by round, but three of those four teams that you would have to get by are capable of uh, of beating you as the top team. Yeah, you're eventually going to find a crack in the sidewalk and step on it when you're playing this many games in the NCAA basketball tournament. And I think it also goes to a lot what we talk about when football gets here, about repeating as defending Super Bowl champions or even uh, NCAA college football champions, it's it's not so much the fact that you're the targeted team, which you are, obviously, but also what you went through the previous year to get there, you know, you put your all into everything and you achieve that. Are you able to climb that same mountain with the same intent and the same vigor the very next year? I think it's a very, very difficult task, and those are a lot of reasons why you don't find repeat champions, especially when you have a mob of 64 teams or 68 teams now that are coming after you in a tournament just like this. Another okay. thing to consider, by at, the when way. When you look at Connecticut, when you look at the East, I mean, if they beat Stetson, they got a, they're gonna, they might very possibly have to play Florida Atlantic, who's very dangerous. Of course, very they dangerous. You couldn't end up against Northwestern, who I don't think that much of. But then you've got UAB, San Diego State, and then Auburn coming up against Yale, which would move on. To, and the, Connecticut's got to play Florida Atlantic, Connecticut, and then possibly, I mean, you look at the other end of it, there's a lot of good teams in here. Uh, Iowa, Illinois State, BYU, uh, Washington State. I mean, there's a lot of good teams in there. Just to get out of the East, it's going to be murder. To get you out still have two East. games left once you get out of the East. And by, by the, the way, way keep in mind, too, this is not the same team as last year. Yeah. You know, two of their big players are in the NBA. Actually, three of them are in the NBA. Two of their top and, and another very important part of their team. Real uh, good point. They're also, and this is a gambling show, they're, they're, they're three or four to one to win the national championship. Why would we invest heavy money in something that hasn't happened in, what, 25, 30 years? Why would we do that? I mean, now, now maybe. Well, first, if, first, first of all, you wouldn't do that. What you would do. Roll it over. Take Connecticut. If you, if you like, I mean, I have a, a long-term future bet, just like I did with San Francisco Niners in, in football, yeah. which ended up going against in the Super Bowl because it didn't it didn't work out. But in this case, you just take Connecticut, put a hundred dollars down on them, but when you roll it over to the next bet, you don't take the three or four one because you end up with a lot better price yep. at the end by rolling it over the the full six games that they have to play. And you're not going to get. Don't take the bookmaker's price. It's a terrible price. Well, by the so way, explain Mark, how. Oh, explain great bet ex right now anyway. Explain what you mean by rollover. Well, take the hundred dollars, and in this case, you're going to be playing Stetson. So, Andy, um, you probably have the numbers. I don't know. What I'll, I'll, I'll make it. Let's say that. Let's say they're ten to one on the money line. They're probably much larger, but let's make it simple. 
they're, they, so you're going to bet $100 to win $10. So now you take the $110 that you win in the game one and you invest the $110 money line on Connecticut in their next round. And let's say you collect uh, after that the 110 Let's say now you got 240 You roll that over into their third game to the, as long as they go alive. And if the, at the end of six games, your $100 will be much better than uh, $400 because you will uh, – uh, you know, you go from well. I'm sorry. You you go from the 110. You'll go to the 140. Then you might go to 210. What you have to invest because you're going to win much less than what you bet for the first three or four games. But ultimately, you'll probably end up with I'll say somewhere it's between 525 and 600 dollars minus your 100, which would be 520, 425 to so 500, the rather than just win 400. Six to one, which is much better than yeah. three to one. But You're tuned in, Mark Lawrence. Go ahead. Even, Go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. I don't want to jump in. Even at that, it's not a great bet to make it now because of where they are. And you should have made it back in November, December yeah. when you would have gotten big odds. Now, by the way, Mark, you mentioned something. It's not as applicable in college basketball for a number of reasons, but it's certainly applicable in the, uh, let's say, the NBA and uh, in um, pro football. And to a certain extent, college. Well, I'm going to say I'm going to say pro football because you you have long playoff teams, and that is, and I don't hear it mentioned often, is the wear and tear that playing all those extra games in consecutive seasons takes on you. Like for example, and that's what's impressive about Kansas City, they've been able to come that because let's say you make the playoffs four or five years in a row and you win a couple of games. So now it's the next season, you make the playoffs again. You will have played over the last three, four, five years the equivalent of almost a full extra season of games. Whether it be in the in the NBA, it could take you know 18 to 20 games to win an NBA title, playing through all the series and sometimes even more. So after two or three years of making it into the NBA Finals, you will have added up an extra 60 or 70 games that you will have played, equivalent to a final season. So now, of course, the rosters change a little bit, but for the nucleus of teams to stay together, that takes a lot of wear and tear. And I say, especially in the NBA, where you're running up and down the court and you're taking all that pounding of the feet uh, over and over basically the equivalent of nearly a full season as opposed to some of the teams that may have only been making the playoffs for you know, a year or two prior. As I was saying before, guys, uh, you're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. And if you like what we're doing here, click on the like button below. We would greatly appreciate it. And if you have any questions or comments, we've got the answers. Simply click on the comment button below and we'll get back to you with an answer ASAP. With that, guys, let's roll into our next segment here, next segment subject matter, and it's really on the heels of what we just talked about. A little bit more specific, the teams that got snubbed in the NCAA basketball tournament. We hit on St. John's. We all know the world of which Rick Pitino lives in these days. I have, <laughs> uh, I, I see Rick uh, quite often at the Gulfstream racetrack uh, in the offseason here. He's an avid horse racing fan, as am I, so I know he'll be he's seething right now for sure. And justifiably so. But let me ask you guys this. Uh, of the teams that did get snubbed, and St. John's, I think, personally, would be at the top of the list for what they did this year. Uh, this interesting note, and I'll pass it on to you guys about other teams you feel that, other than Johnny's, may have been the number one snub. But there were also, in addition to Johnny's, you can also talk about maybe six teams that were snubbed that didn't even opt to go into the NIC, NIT tournament. And I don't know if that's good for the world of college basketball. I really don't. It's like saying, give me my marbles. I'm going to go home. You know, you didn't let me play. I want to get out of here. Uh, but along with St. John's, you had teams like Pittsburgh and Indiana, Old Miss, Oklahoma, and Washington that said no to the NIT basketball tournament. Andy, do you think that was a justified move for teams like that to be snubbed and say no to the NIT? Well, I think it's an individual school basis. And, we don't know how many of the teams refused because of the costs involved, how many teams refused because the players took it. The coaches did a canvas the players and they said, no, it's been a long season. We've been at this every day since November. We don't want to play. And they turned it down. Uh, and, you know, the NIT used to be the premier tournament for like 40 years, yes. getting back to the 19. 19- 20s and 30s up until uh, really the NCAA got a lot of coverage in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, and it's taken off since then. But at this point, the NIT and the CBI and the CIT, I mean, they're nice tournaments, but I think the most people who are interested in them, I don't know how many of the school fans are betters. It's for the betting, it's for the betting public to have additional games to play, especially from a handicapping standpoint where you're playing at uh, home, home arenas. Uh, for example, we're doing this 
podcast uh, early when early mid Wednesday afternoon. Well, there's a game tonight between UNLV and Princeton. UNLV was not a, a, in consideration for an at-large bid. Princeton certainly was, and they were talked about being uh, from early in the season on from their non-conference schedule as being a possible at-large qualifier. Nonetheless, UNLV is traveling all the way across the country, and you have to wonder, are they going to play with that same kind of intensity? Princeton is Princeton. They're going to play their smart basketball all then. But you have that situation in a number of, uh, uh, of matchups where teams might just not be interested in playing. It's been the long season, uh, but from a handicapping standpoint, does, that does present opportunities. And in fact, uh, the people who do very well uh, in, the, in betting the NIT are aware of those situations as to hey we you know they have connections with some of these teams and they say they're just you know they're really not enthusiastic about it or this team wants to prove a point and you don't know does South Florida want to prove a point that they deserve does Indiana State want to prove a point that they deserve or are they just discuss it and say you know what yeah we'll show up and it gives us additional because kids love to play basketball all the time it gives us an additional opportunity so I'm I'm sort of in agreement with you that uh, yeah it's bad for college basketball but the honest the honesty, the reality of it is nobody's really paying attention because these games are being played with the exception of like last night and tonight for the balance of those tournaments. They're basically being played in the midweek, but everyone else, 95% of the basketball fans are focusing in on the NCAA tournament and their brackets. Uh, Greg and Jim, let me ask you guys this question. Uh, uh, I mentioned a few teams here that were snubbed. Uh, is there any one particular team you think stood head, top, head and shoulders above anybody else that was snubbed? that did indeed deserve to be in this tournament? I think Pittsburgh deserved to be in. Um, I mentioned before, I, they I'm definitely with you. should have gotten in over top of Virginia, but that was just my opinion. A lot of people agree. Um, St. John's, of course, you mentioned that too. There, there, there are a number out there. That, um, there's the other issue too, is that we had five bid stealers this year. Normally it's only two or three. But this year, from what I heard on one of the podcasts, there were five bid stealers, which means the teams that won their conference regular season lost in their tournament, and the, the bids went to lesser quality teams according to their records during the regular season. That mixed up a lot of stuff. When you, when you end up, with, instead of two, you end up with five. Greg, let me ask you this. What about a, a team like Ohio State who, you know, made a transition or uh, their complexion changed uh, throughout the basketball season when they changed head coaches? They became a completely different basketball team. And they played really well down the stretch. Did Ohio State deserve to be in this tournament? Not really, because the Big Ten in general was down quite a bit. And because of that, that's what you had to weigh. Like, who were they beating when they were making this run? So, um and I mean, my rant last year had to do with my team, Rutgers, not getting in. And Andy mentioned how all of a sudden now this year they're not gonna they're not going to weigh uh, how teams have fared in the last say six weeks compared to the entire season. Well, wait a second. Last year when Rutgers didn't make it, you did take that into account because that's the reason Rutgers didn't make it because they didn't play well down the stretch. Uh, they beat Penn State twice, and you put Penn State over Rutgers. Well, that's the only excuse, is that Rutgers didn't play well down the stretch, and Penn State did. So as you've been pointing out, it's all about uh, what they want to do and how they want to shape their decisions. But no, to get, answer your question, I don't think so based on that. Um, and again, if they wanted to prove it, then they needed to go further in the tournament. Uh, if they would have made a run like to the semis, maybe they would have got more of a shot. But yeah, that's that's the last stand. And for me... Um, this season in particular, I don't see big bubble teams that really stick out. So therefore the ones that I want to look at are the teams that got robbed that had great regular seasons in some of the smaller conferences like South Florida. So, or Indiana state or Indiana state. Uh, Indiana, uh, Indiana, yeah. 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 By, the, by the way, Mark, I'll answer. I sort of, just, like my, my opening comments talked about the mountain West versus the big East. Yeah. One of the things is, and, and Jim, Jim did this when, when he mentioned, um, if you're going to say a team should have been in that didn't get in, you also have to answer the question, which team would you take out? Jim said, for example, Virginia, he might have picked Pitt over Virginia, same conference, okay? Uh, if I said, okay, St. John should have been in, 
who would I take out? My first answer would be, and I, I like the Mountain West Conference, but again, six teams, I would have taken out one of the Mountain West teams, and I don't know which one it would have been, but I would have come up with an answer if I needed to be specific. You do have to consider which team you would have eliminated from the field if you wanted to put another team in, and I don't know if the committee either really thinks about it. Now, the Bracketologists do because they all show the last four in and the first four out, so they've got their answers to that. The committee doesn't have an answer for that. That's a great point, real good point. Uh, okay, with that, guys, let's do this. Uh, we've hit a little bit on the winners and the losers and the snub guys and everything and so forth and whatnot like that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit now about the long shots or the teams that we want to either put on our brackets to help ensure our brackets, a uh, success in our brackets. And we always need some of these long shots, especially in these first round games. Nobody loves anything better than to find a number 12 seed making it to the Sweet 16. Because when that happens, you're just about in clover if something like that happens, like just like that. So I'm going to turn it over to our, our producer, Greg De Palma. And I know Greg's got some questions here about uh, what we're talking about here, long shots and futures for the NCAA tournament. Greg, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. So, uh, and by the way, we are going to give our official, we'll give our official futures picks uh, to end the show. Uh, yes. Everybody will have their own, uh, you know, whether it's one, two or three uh, high uh, long shots to keep an eye on that might want to put, put some money on. Um, all right. So what we did, and uh, uh, we do this every year. Um, Mark's done it with me for the last few years. We take a look at some really important trends that have to do with upsets. So we're going to start. And, and again, this, these are questions for the panel. So um, we're going to start with, uh, with you, Mark. Uh, okay, uh, this is a 15 seed question. Which 15 seed has the best chance to upset a two seed? Now that's important mm -hmm. because one 15 seed has upset a two seed in the last three tournaments. Princeton did it last year against Arizona. We just talked about Arizona. And is that part of the reason that uh, maybe they should have got a number one seed or not? St. Peter's upset Kentucky in 2022, and Oral Roberts upset Ohio State in 2021. So, Mark, which 15 seed do you think has the best chance for an upset? I would say, looking over the chart here, I might go to St. Peter's against Tennessee. I'm not really keen on Tennessee. I know they play some pretty good defense, but we've talked before in the past about Rick Barnes finding ways to lose games rather than <laughs> win, win games. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if he's on the sidelines uh, – over the, on this weekend there, I'm not going to be all that stunned or all that surprised. This is the sort of a basketball team in St. Peter's that lives for situations just like this. Uh, you know, they come from a, a, a nondescript lower edge conference and doing something like that. My vote's going to be on St. Peter's over Tennessee. Uh, Andy, uh, we, uh, we, we did a, 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 a prep a couple of days ago. Um, we weren't able to post the video. Uh, so nobody knows what your answers were from the other day. So, uh, but you uh, seem to agree with Mark. Is that still uh, your feeling with St. Peter's? You're uh, muted, Andy. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't even recall that I mentioned St. Peter's the other day. So <laughs> I was looking at these questions. Be, no, be, because it was not really, we didn't have this kind of, 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 of agenda listed specifically, as I recall. In fact, I think, uh, wasn't your first question today going to be about the first four teams to advance? So maybe we'll get to that next. But but when I first looked at it today, realize, or not realizing that we had talked about it before, the first thought went to St. Peter's. Several okay. reasons. And Mark mentioned a number of them. Number one, and you mentioned it earlier in the intro, they have already know they can do it. They did it two years ago in beating uh, Kentucky from the number 15 spot. Number two, they played a very competitive uh, Metro Atlantic uh, Conference Tournament. They won their first game by two points. I believe that was in the uh, putback of a uh, missed uh, shot to, to win, I think it was 62-60. I think they won their second game by two points, and they won the championship game by five. So they've already shown this season, within the last week, the ability to win close games. Now, clearly, the competition they're going to face in a number two seed such as Tennessee, is considerably different than the three teams they beat in the conference, even though they were competitive games. But they also have the confidence that they can win those close games because they just did it. And Mark also mentioned some of the drawbacks of uh, Tennessee, and that is uh, the coaching, the uh, continued, despite being, I think this is like their fifth tournament in the last six tournaments or something in Tennessee. I think they may have made the Sweet 16 once during that time. So they've been able to win first-round games and occasional second-round games. But I think they've generally underperformed expectations entering the tournament, especially over the last couple of years. So I don't think it'll happen. But if it does happen, I think St. Peter's would be the 15th seed most likely to do so. All right, uh, Jim. 
Uh, what do you think? Do you agree with them with St. Peter's? Because uh, Tony um, gave his picks, and Long Beach State was his pick. Of course, Dan Monson, it's a great story. Uh, he's fired, but they let him coach. And they were supposed to be one of the top teams in the Big West this season, and they actually had a couple of nice upsets. They beat USC on the road. So uh, I don't know what happened there. He's had a great run. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's something else. But he's he's a gone man when the season's over. But his players obviously are playing hard for him, and they won the championship. They st- they got the bid. So now they're taking on an Arizona team that has lost two out of three and lost last year to a 15 seed. Not sure they could do it back to back years. But uh, do you agree with these boys with St. Peter's? Do you like Long Beach State, or do you like another 15 seed? I like both plays. I, I actually, I actually bet um, Long Beach State. I took I think twenty one, if it, if not, it was twenty one and a half against Arizona. I definitely think they can play with them. I think the styles match. I think they can hang in there and make it tough. St. Peter's, you got to you got to go back to what they what the guys said. They know they can do this because they've done it. And then of course we got Rick Barnes, who's always going to do us a favor in game doing something. But, I mean, these teams are 20-point dogs, or should be. And when you look at the power ratings, you should run 20-point differences in power ratings. So it's it's a big move. But uh, I would say either one, but I actually bet more on, on Long Beach. Well, the good thing is, is that uh, if it holds up, all you have to do, even if you, uh, if you just believe one of them is going to do it, then you do all four, and you'll definitely make money. So you just cover your tracks. But those two definitely look like the more likely uh, upsets. But you never know. I mean, it could be another 15 seed that we're not even talking about. Um, let's go back to what uh, – because uh, this question, again, we posed when we were doing our prep show the other day. But the first four has started. But it is relevant because Colorado State had the blowout win over Virginia. So they're still one of these teams that qualifies. And what Andy was um, uh, re- uh, referring to was that uh, the first four, they've had a team – uh, that in the 12-year history, um, they have had 12 teams advancing to the second round. It means they've won two games. Um, and that includes FDU upsetting Pitt last year. And there's two teams that actually made a run in the first four all the way to the final four. That was VCU in 2011 and UCLA just a couple of years ago in 2021. So um, b- between Colorado State and then the winner of Colorado Boise State, which one of those three teams, Mark, do you think has the best chance to make a little bit of a run? I think it would be Colorado, but the, again, uh, we're doing the show on Wednesday. They haven't played yet, so uh, I could come up empty big time there, like I came up empty big time against Virginia last night. So you're gonna <laughs> look, at, look at me and say, "What did you even ask him for?" <laughs> <laughs> But well, actually, like- Tony and uh, and uh, Andy. I don't know if you remember now, Andy, but uh, they both went with Colorado. Nice. I like the makeup of the basketball team. Uh, Tad Boyle's got a lot of coaching experience. But, again, they're going to have to get the job done Wednesday as we do the show. Uh, but either or, as you mentioned here, the state of Colorado, I think, is going to make a little bit of noise moving forward at some point in this tournament. Andy, you sticking with Colorado? Uh, now that I know the result of the Colorado State game, my initial thought, again, forgetting that I had mentioned Colorado the other day because I didn't really have a chance to research it, I could see either of those two teams. I like this Colorado State team because I think that they can defeat uh, their uh, their next opponent, which would be Texas, because they're a somewhat of a flawed team, yep. and they would, they would most likely uh, get to face Tennessee, and for the same reason that uh, – uh, that I could see St. Peter's winning. I could see Colorado State winning. They have an outstanding player who did not have a good game last night, and they won despite that. They have an up-and-coming uh, coach who's highly respected, has uh, some good tutelage behind him, and I think Colorado State has a uh, a really good opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised if both teams, Colorado State and Colorado, assuming they get by Boise, uh, would, would advance at least uh, another round, uh, or at least win their, their first round. Yeah, their, their field of 64 game. I don't know I could say the same about Boise State, but I certainly could about Colorado. A little bit of advantage for these teams that play in the play-in game, in my opinion, is they get some of the nervousness out because you are in the big dance and they've already played a game, they've already won a game, and the other guys have been sitting around a little bit wondering, you know, what's this going to be like? Unless they, they're a veteran team that's been there a lot, but which doesn't happen that often. 
But uh, Colorado made Colorado State look uh, very live to me. Yeah, Matt, I remember we talked about Colorado State as a very intriguing uh, team that was on the bubble last week because they had already beaten Colorado, Creighton, and a couple of other pretty decent uh, uh, teams outside the Mountain West. And uh, they did lose in the championship game to a very hot New Mexico team that could be very dangerous in this tournament. So let's uh, move on to the next question, and that is going to be regarding double-digit seeds in the Sweet 16. At least one double-digit seed has advanced to the Sweet 16 in 36 of 38 years. And it happened again last year when the 15-seed Princeton advanced in tw- uh, to the Sweet 16. So, uh, guys, start Mark, starting with you. And, and look, if you've got more than one, because I have more than one, especially I think, I think the way the, the sport is going, I think we are going to see more than one. Not saying that, that it's only been one in the 36 to 38 years, but I think with so much parity now in the sport, I think this is going to happen a lot more often. So uh, do you have one? Do you have a couple of teams, a couple of double-digit seeded teams that you think will advance to the Sweet 16? I think there's uh, three teams that have a pretty good chance of advancing now. And if one of these advance, we'll end up being looking good. But uh, I don't, I'd don't. i be surprised if not one of these three make it. Uh, one of them would be Moorhead State. I think they oh. can take Illinois out in this opening basketball game. Here. Wow. They, bring, they bring a lot to the table here, Moorhead State does. When you look at their team statistically, uh, they reckon the top ten in a lot of uh, statistics coming into the season here. Then you've got an Illinois basketball team that comes out of the Big Ten Conference. And in our database, you go back and you look at Big Ten teams and win the championship. They tend to really struggle in the first game, first round of the NCAA basketball tournament. So if a team could come flat, it could be Illinois. Hmm. And if they do, they could pay the price against a team like Moorhead State. But I'm going to I'm going to use a two team tandem here uh, to answer the other half of this question here. And I'm going to fade both of the teams out of uh, the Big West. Uh, I'm going to use uh, McNeese State over Gonzaga, or the West Coast Conference, I should say. Uh, McNeese State over Gonzaga, and uh, I like this McNeese State team really well. Uh, first of all, they're one of these uh, pedigree 12 seeds, taking points from a five seed, which last year, by the way, 12 seeds did not win a basketball game. That's kind of a rarity to find a 12 seed, not upset a five seed. It did happen last year. And I think that's going to come back to the norm more likely than not this year. Uh, you've got in Gonzaga, a basketball team that uh, has normally won that conference, didn't win it this year. Now they're going to go into this tournament without that uh, championship label on them, per se, if you will. And Gonzaga has not been a good team in the NCAA basketball tournament, especially to the spread. They've really, really struggled point-wise. And I think they can do that again in this McNeese State basketball game here. This McNeese State, they're coached by Will Wade. He used to be the head coach at LSU. Uh, he's a very, very good basketball coach, and he's got this basketball team, I think, poised to make a lot of noise. They're number one in the country in win margin, number three in both defensive field goal percentage and turnover margin. They're number five in the country in defensive points per game, and they're in the top ten, number ten in offensive field goal percentage. They bring a ton to the table statistically, does McNeese State in this game. And I think Gonzaga, after losing to St. Mary's, could end up coming flat in this first-round basketball game. And to close out my segment here for a double-digit seed, I'm going to also fade St. Mary's, who had a really spectacular basketball season here this year. But uh, I'm going to look at Moorhead State against them. Uh, This is a Moorhead State basketball team, much like McNeese State. Doesn't get a lot of ink, but does a lot of things well. Uh, And I think St. Mary's living a little bit too much of a champagne high life, having now beat Gonzaga and finally toppled them uh, to win, to come into this tournament here. But you've got, again, another 12 seed taking it from a five seed here. So put me down from Moorhead and McNeese. And uh, we'll also, like I say, start it out and look for that big upset in the Illinois basketball game as well. So St. Mary's might have their problems with Grand Canyon. Yeah, they have uh, watching them play in that uh, championship game, and I know it, it can look a little bit uh, misleading because of the you know you're you're not playing uh, against top competition, but uh, they have this kid uh, Grant Foster uh, who just looks like a real exciting player, and just one of those players that you just get the feeling that he's going to do something and he's going to make a name for himself in the tournament. Um, and and look who's coaching the team, it's Bryce Drew. I mean, for if you're going to take an upset in, in, in the tournament, you're going to do it with a coach uh, that had uh, the all-time uh, college basketball shot 
uh, in March Madness. So why not Bruce Dr- Bruce uh, Bryce Drew, uh, a lead coach team, and K- Grand Canyon putting St. Mary's away? And by the way, that's yeah. an interesting little bracket because I know Andy uh, likes Charleston. So I think Charleston and Grand Canyon might face each other off with a bid uh, for the opportunity to go to the Sweet 16, Andy. Uh, let me correct myself real quick here, Greg. When I mentioned about fading St. Mary's, I meant to say using Grand Canyon in that basketball game. We're going to fade both Gonzaga and St. Mary's as five seeds against 12 seeds. And Grand Canyon, as you just mentioned here, is a basketball team that indeed can make a lot of noise as well. Yep. So you, know, you put me down for those two 12 seeds, if you will, for possible upsets in, in this first round basketball. By the way, Mark, game. out of those two, Grand Canyon and McNeese, which one do you think is the best chance to hit the Sweet 16? I think that would be McNeese State. I, this basketball team is really, really talented, and a lot of people don't know it or appreciate it. And, and if they get by this first round here, I think they're going to make a lot of noise. Okay. Andy? I also uh, agree with uh, Moorhead State getting by Illinois, and in which case they would play the winner of BYU and Duquesne, and I think Moorhead can win that game as well before their run ends, likely against uh, Iowa State. Wow. The McNeese and Gonzaga is an interesting game. I'm not so sure that, I mean, I love McNeese State. I've loved them all season. But I'm not so sure. First of all, with Gonzaga, this is finally a year where there are no expectations yeah. from Gonzaga. They're always a you know, one two seed, and everybody's saying, and always disappointed. They finally made it to a conference, to a, a championship game a few years ago, losing to North Carolina. To me, Gonzaga proved what they are. I mean, they still had a very good season, just not as good as St. Mary's. But they proved what they are on that last Saturday of the regular season when they went down to St. Mary's. And thinking that they may have needed to win to have a chance at an at-large bid unless they won the conference tournament, they won that game. I want to say it was a 13-point win. They were in charge of most of that game. And that proved something to me about Gonzaga. And I will never take Mark Few lightly. Now, as far as the matchup against McNeese, I'm playing McNeese in the first half because I could see what could happen. You know, they're staying way up in class. I think they can give Gonzaga a game for a half, but I'm not sure because of the difference in talent uh, that that McNeese State could hold it off long enough before we see Gonzaga open things up in the second half, whether it be early in the second half as they did in that uh, uh, first game before St. Mary's against San Francisco, which was a one-point game at halftime. They won by double digits. Or if they make a late sprint uh, past a tiring uh, McNeese team. But I will be playing McNeese in the um, uh, in, in the first half in that game, and I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if McNeese actually enters halftime uh, with, uh, with a lead. Uh, I'm also looking, but uh, I don't think that they are the double-digit seed that will advance. I did mention Moorhead. I also wouldn't be surprised if North Carolina State takes the momentum from their ACC championship and wins a game or two in the tournament. I also think Nevada has a chance to uh, make, make a run. I don't like the way Dayton played down the stretch. I like the way Nevada finished the season. It actually was pretty consistent all season. So I think Nevada can win that first game, and then they would most likely – almost certainly, face Arizona. And I think Arizona is a vulnerable uh, seed. Again, coming from the uh, Pac-12, that was not a very uh, strong conference this year. So uh, that's another double-digit seed that I think can make a bit of a run. Uh, By the way, Tony has Nevada and Oregon as his two teams that he believes can make the run to the Sweet 16 as a double-digit seed. By the way, I did mention Charleston. I'm still sold on them, but I had to limit it to to no more than three. I could see them making a run, but they have a little bit more difficult task. Yeah, I, I actually like Charleston uh, and Grand Canyon uh, with Grand Canyon winning. So we're kind of on the same page there, all three of us. Uh, Jim? Well, you, you know, you mentioned what Tony said about Oregon. Nobody's mentioned that before. That's an excellent choice. 11 seed going against South Carolina, but their their power ratings are very close. And if you take, I mean, that's a big separation, 11 seed to a 6 seed, when the power ratings of the two teams are so close. Very possibly that could be an 11 that moves on. All right. Yeah, I've got, besides that those teams, I like New Mexico. Uh, I, I like their momentum. Again, Mountain West, they've got the proven veteran players on the team. And they're in the, the that, that little region there. I know Baylor is a, uh, a really tough tournament team, but I think they're they're young this year. So I think they could be vulnerable. And we know Arizona's vulnerable as well. And then the other teams that I would look at, I totally agree with NC State. I actually think NC State can go a long way. I think that they might have this little charm thing going on. So I really like NC State for the long haul. 
But I also want to keep an eye on James Madison. And I know you look at Houston and, and, and Houston's the number one and all this, but this James Madison team is just so talented and they've proven they can win these big games. And I think they're not going off Duke. And so I think James Madison uh, uh, could have something to say uh, against Houston. But just getting to that point in the Sweet 16, I think James Madison can knock off Duke. I've seen, I've seen Duke lose these types of matchups plenty times before, uh, including the year they lost to Lehigh when uh, Steph Curry was there. My, my only uh, concern about James Madison is they got national notoriety when they opened the season with that win at Michigan State, which was projected. I think Blue Ribbon had him like number five or number six in the nation. Clearly, they did not live up to those expectations. Now, But that win over Michigan State has stayed with a lot of people throughout the year as far as James Madison goes, and they, they did extremely well winning their conference tournament, etc. But that's my only concern because I'd love to be on James Madison. It's another team that I might very well play in the first half of their game against uh, Duke if they end up having that matchup. One and game the- I'd like to mention, it's a 13 seed versus a four Samford. Yes. Um, I, yes. I'm not, I'm not really. Especially with the color now out. But Kansas has had a very rocky season. Yes. And they're very capable of going out. I mean, yes, this is a, you know, for 13 seed. So, but you're looking for a possibility. Samford can play some ball. Yep. Yes. I love that one because Jim, yeah, you I mean, said you, Jim, you said Samford, not Stanford. That's, that's correct. That right? is correct. S A M F O R D. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and I and I and I hundred percent agree. I, I just don't like what I'm seeing out of Kansas right now. They're, they're just not playing good basketball. Andy just mentioned they got an injury as well. Uh, I mean, they got destroyed. You know, uh, they're just not looking good. And so, and they had really haven't looked good for most of the season. The typical no, Kansas team, even when both of their key players, uh, Dickinson and um, McCuller, were were healthy and playing well, they struggled in a lot more. Yeah, they were unbeaten at home, I think, for during the regular season, but they they weren't winning in typical Kansas fashion. And, and by the way, um, uh, I, I I meant uh, when uh, Steph Curry was on uh, Davidson, not Lehigh, because I remember Lehigh. Uh, upsetting Duke, and that was obviously a very big upset in the tournament. And um, it, it, but that's what happens too, isn't it? Sometimes, you, if you're in the tournament as as many times as these big programs are, that leaves you vulnerable. Every once in a while, you're going to get upset. That's what's the beauty of the NCAA tournament. Is you know, even if you're a top four seed every year, like Duke was with Shostevsky, every five years they would lose, like in the in the second round, to a team that nobody expected them to lose to. So. Guys, let me ask you this. Uh, I understand one, at least one of the two starters for Kansas that's been out is going to be back this weekend. Have you heard any word McCullough, about the McCuller has been ruled out uh, for the season with uh, yeah, he's uh, the out. injury. So the question I have to ask of you is this. Is then with, uh, with the other starter back here, does this not look like an awfully short price for a Kansas basketball team against Samford? What is the uh, price? They, op- they opened up eight and a half with the uncertainty surrounding the two players, but it, it's seemingly more optimistic than it turned out to be. Then they ruled that Dickinson is probable. McCullough is out. The line dropped initially to eight, and the last I saw was seven and a half. So they have made an adjustment. But, yeah, it seemed to be a low line given not just the reputation of Kansas, but the fact that they are a, a, a still a very good team, although they don't have a great d- amount of depth, which is even for, for hurt even more. Sanford, again, a team that's moving up in class. But you know what? If, if you disregarded the fact that teams were moving up in class, you'd never be able to pick an upset because you'd always say, oh. you know, when you do your first run through the bracket, you see a lot of, you know, one, two, threes, and fours advancing until you take a closer look. Sanford is the kind of team based upon the – the issues deal with their opponent, Kansas, and also some of the strengths that they have shown. And again, it may be a smaller conference, but you're still beating teams that are familiar with you, and you're beating them often twice in a season. I agree with what Jim said about Sanford. They're a really nice basketball team. I think my only question that I have is, is there value in the game? That's my only question. What's the money line on it? Well, the answer is probably no. It's probably taken out of the market. Uh, we're kind of stuck with what we got. Yes. Well, the money line, though, is still pretty decent, though, isn't it? Yeah, but you're taking the dog to win straight up, and that's yeah, that's, uh, absolutely. That might be a hard proposition. All right, let's next uh, turn our attention to the uh, trend on the board, and this one is: uh, we're, we're, I'm just going to ask you, there are four 11 seeds. 
So I'm going to ask you to give us one 11 seed that definitely makes it to the Sweet 16. That's important because at least <laughs> one 11 seed has advanced to the Sweet 16 in eight of the last nine tournaments, with three advancing to the Elite Eight and two to the Final Four. Now, keep this in mind, no 11 seed advanced to the Sweet 16 last year. So I don't know if a new trend starting, so keep that in mind. But there are some really dangerous 11 seeds, including New Mexico, NC State, and Oregon. Uh, Mark, who would you go with? Well, the only 11 seed that I really like, are, or I should say I like, I don't really like, but I like is NC State. I don't like the other three 11 seeds. Uh, New Mexico's really kind of come back after teetering on the brink. They started out so well, and then they you know, they ran up against a real rough pad, but they closed out real strong. Uh, but it's NC State that right now that is playing with the hot hand, and as you mentioned before, uh, Greg, I think they can make a lot of noise in the tournament. They would be my choice, NC State. Andy? Because you had NC State the other day. You sticking with that? Well, I, I, my other thought that I was thinking was possibly Oregon, who I know Tony likes quite a bit. I just wonder if they could get by Creighton. Uh, the other, one of the other number 11 seeds, Duquesne, I'm not sure uh, that they could get by Illinois if indeed Moorhead State does not pull the upset that uh, I think uh, a couple of us like here. So, yes, I am staying with NC State, and I do like the uh, the draw that they have. I think they can get by Texas Tech, although I do like Texas as a, Texas Tech as a team, and those were two teams I was looking to, to play on uh, before they got matched against each other. And we talked about Kentucky and some of their vulnerabilities. So I think yep. that uh, NC State could match up nicely against them, especially uh, defensively against uh, uh, Kentucky. You know, Kentucky, I think, was number one or number two in three-point field goal percentage uh, this year, if I recall correctly. And if those aren't falling, that could be uh, uh, trouble for them. In fact, yeah, I'm showing a number. I'm talking in the field of 68. Kentucky was number one in uh, three-point field goals, making a little bit over 41%. So if NC State can frustrate them a little bit, they can pull that upset. Jim? Well, I mentioned it before. I'm going to take uh, Oregon to move on. Okay. I, I, I definitely believe it. Look at Oregon, take it on South Carolina, and then they uh, move on. <laughs> it would be very tough. And Creighton's a very – I like Creighton a lot. Moving into the 16 off that, that might be tough. I may be wrong with that. I like Oregon in the first matchup. The second matchup is um, a little bit more difficult. Creighton's a tough team. Yeah, I, I might have picked Oregon against any of the other number uh, uh, number three seeds or uh, number uh, seeds that they would be facing. All right, just two more to go. Give us one seven seed or lower to make the final four. Now, keep in mind, a seven seed or lower has reached the final four nine of the last ten tournaments, with 12 making it the last 12 years, including nine seed FAU last year. So a seven seed or lower to make the final four, Mark. I'm going to stick with the M&M boys, guys. Moorhead State or McNeese. Uh, wow, you, all the way to the final four. You know, well, look at the look at the path. Oh, you got to Mark. Just keep in mind. I think you keep knocking uh, into papers into the mic. I'm sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, just keep an eye on that. Okay, but take a look at the the path that McNeese might have uh, to get there if they yeah. if they do get win this first basketball game, then they're likely to hook Kansas, if not Samford, but hook a Kansas basketball team that's not 100%. They're vulnerable. Yes, exactly. Now, they would then have to probably most likely get past Purdue. That's a which, vulnerable team. Well, that, that's also a team that they're likely not <laughs> going to get past. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, my other guy, Moorhead, uh, I really like their chances of a possible upset here against Illinois. Uh, if they do that, uh, who have they got in front of them? They've got likely BYU. I don't think uh, – yeah. I don't see Duquesne getting past BYU. Uh, and I think BYU is beatable in a game like that. Then they're going to hook most likely Iowa State, uh, who could be maybe perhaps tripped up. So between the m M&M boys, if I had to take one game, give me Moorhead State. I like it. Moorhead State along with uh, – Possibly McNeese. McNeese State. Yeah, yeah, I like it. All right. Uh, a a Andy, uh, what do you got here for us as far as uh, seven seed or lower all the way to the Final Four? Well, it's a team that uh, has uh, has drawn some support in the betting markets because they opened up as an underdog and are now a very slight favorite. That's Drake. Oh, yeah, baby. That's my by, team. 
Yeah. I'm looking for them to get by uh, uh, Washington State, and they most likely will be matched up with in-state rival Iowa State. Now, yeah. the second year in a row that Drake has made the tournament by winning the uh, MVC uh, uh, tournament. So I would think that there'll be a lot of emotion, and the game is being played in Omaha, so both teams should be very well uh, represented in uh, in that regional site. And I think that most of the fans, well, I don't, Iowa State travels well, but I think Drake will also. But most of the fans from the other teams that uh, might be uh, around for the other part of the game, if uh, uh, part of the doubleheader, will be cheering for the underdog uh, uh, Drake team if indeed they make it. Uh, then they would most likely have to play. Oh, I don't know. I guess uh, I have Auburn advancing out of the uh, uh, top uh, part of that bracket, who I have going further. But they could be facing UConn as well. Uh, yeah. That might be a team. It's going to be very difficult. But they get all these teams we're picking. If you're a seven seed or lower, are going to have to beat some, you know, one or two sure. seeds most likely to get there. Yeah. So I'll have Drake uh, being my long shot to make it. To all the right, final. Andy. Yes, I, I might, Drake. I might have a I might have a mistake here, on, but I'm looking at the, the ratings. The seedings, Washington State is a 7 and Drake is a 10? Yep. I thought we were That's looking right. just at 7 seeds. No, no, no. 7 seeds or lower. Or lower. Well, you can, or higher. I mean, everybody or, is different. I, 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 I can say worse. The, 7 or worse. Yeah, 7 or worse. Okay. Yeah, worse, worse or better is clear. Yeah. Okay. They won't say that on uh, national TV, though. So no. that's why we go with. Uh, uh, I, then I would never say that. Yeah. But, <laughs> well, do you do you uh, go ahead, Jim? Do you have someone seven or uh, worse that uh, will make the final four? With bo- both Drake and Washington State. In that's other right. Words, seven or higher rated number. Wise. Yeah, or lower rated. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 We want a lower they, rated a, team. Yes, or a, a higher numerically rated team. higher number seed. Numerically higher number seed. But it, we're seven, not on three, network six, TV, eight. so it's worse. Right. Um, hmm. I, I would, yeah. Because it's gonna happen, Jim. So some some team's gonna oh, make the it's run. Gonna, it's definitely gonna happen. Morehead, I like it. Uh, Drake, I like it. Uh, but you know, you're looking at the second rounds. You're not you're not liking it as much. But um, I know you've got NC State. You have James Grand Madison. Grand Canyon. I mean, Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon by that first game. Uh, hey, maybe they, Michigan State they, knocks off North Carolina. Maybe maybe it helps. So Michigan they don't have to State knock them off. Have, Michigan State has to beat Mississippi State first. True. That is not easy. And you got Oregon. But like, you know, you said they're going to face Creighton next. So that's not good. No. So, I mean, you got... Um, Colorado's a 10 seed. We give Colorado a chance because we like both Colorado and Colorado State. We all sort of favored that. But Colorado's facing Florida. Yeah, that's nothing. That, they can Florida get by Florida. A, I, I like I like these teams coming off these play-in games because they have that. I don't know I mentioned before why. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So no, there, no, no specific that, team that just tickles your, uh, you know, oh, fancy? Well, we, the thing is, we've already talked about them. Like, All the right, teams, there you go. I mean, that's you know, we got Argon, we got which is again, we're going to run into Creighton, which is that's a, somebody you're going to have to be somebody that's tougher than you. That's you it. Know, that's, that's part of the game. St. Peter's, we talked about that. Yep. Colorado State, we talked about that. We've talked about all these teams pretty much at this point. Um, you could look, I and mean, you want to look at something. I love the coach at Oakland. Okay, this is a 14 seed playing Kentucky. Kentucky can. Oakland. Be Oakland. A mess. They have talent. However. Oh, Jim, did you freeze? I think uh, John Calipari. Uh, Cut him off. <laughs> yeah. Because if, uh, if Kentucky loses to uh, Oakland, you know that that's it. It's time to go. It's just, just I'd, li- I'd like to hear, by the way, a proposition posted somewhere when they're announcing the Oakland-Kentucky game, how many people will refer to Oakland as being in uh, the uh, state of California? Oh, yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> just assuming, as opposed yeah. to Michigan, where they are. Yeah, that's a, that's a conference I don't think they're out of the horizon that they haven't really – I don't think they've done a whole – they're still on the horizon, right? 
Yes. Yeah. yeah that, that they haven't done very much lately. Is that the same? That Cleveland State has made they've made some noise um, in recent in years. Past. Yeah, but, I think that's uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Green Bay. Yeah. Yep. So all right. That was John Mackey years for Cleveland State. Right? <laughs> All right, so until we get uh, Jim back. You mean, you mean Mc, was it Mouse McFadden? Was the that Mouse the name? McFadden, exactly. Because yeah. Jim has uh, two uh, uh, two, two uh, lines open, so he'll have to open a third. Okay, so until that happens, the last question I was going to ask you guys has to do with the fact that no uh, four seed or worse has won a national championship since 1997. And that was Arizona as a four seed. That's just amazing to think about with all the upsets and everybody talks about March Madness and crazy things happening. And a four seed or worse has not won since 1997. So it's a big difference between winning early in the rounds as opposed to winning the, the whole thing. Uh, and uh, Arizona was able to do it. Um, so what do you think? Uh, four seed or worse, winning it all, Mark who do you feel most confident with? Well, the four seed or worse. Uh, do you have any of them right now in your bracket in the final four? No. Okay. Uh, but I have I have them in an elite eight. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about Auburn and Duke, uh, and I think uh, just given the fact that if uh, Duke were to get there. Uh, and I think their season was cut short. They were playing some pretty good basketball, and then suddenly uh, it seemed like they went on vacation. Uh, but if you take a look at this basketball team and, and the way the draw will come, uh, for them to get there to the Final Four, they would have to beat Houston, okay, who I think is going to come out of, the, out of the South. But uh, if they did hook, hook Houston here, that's a spot where a Houston basketball team could fall prey to a team with a lot of experience, a lot of talent. With Duke, uh, there's a lot better basketball players that fill out the roster on Duke than there are on the Houston Cougars from top to bottom. Uh, the other guy would be Auburn. Uh, Bruce Pearl has got his basketball team playing some really good basketball right now. Uh, so I would say of the uh, of the seeds, uh, four or worse seeds, I would say either Duke or Auburn. Okay. Andy? I've, uh, I liked Auburn the other day to uh, win the title when we did the uh, the Monday uh, get-together, and I'm sticking with Auburn. Part of it is they're just a very good team, extremely well-balanced, ranked very highly as a number four, as not the number four seed in a region, but against number four seed in the country, top four team and a lot of the, the, the Ken Palm and other ratings that are well-respected. The fact that Connecticut is trying to do something that's only been done twice in nearly 50 years is another reason to like Auburn because I believe they were underseeded and could have easily been a two and a no worse a three. They will probably be the first legitimate team that has a chance to knock UConn out of the tournament. And because they do rank so highly number four nationally, as I mentioned in some of those rankings, they might be the stiffest test that UConn would uh, face as far as depth balance experience you know they they were in the final four a few years ago auburn so uh i like the auburn tigers to complete the run and i actually have them uh defeating uh, houston for the national title yeah especially given the fact that like you mentioned early on on the show andy uh yukon really didn't play much inside the big east you know three teams make the tournament the others were all mediocre at best and they sort of got hammered in the opening run of the nit tournament here so uh that neighborhood in which they live uh yukon could end up biting them in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Auburn played in the SEC, and you could have made a case for a few more teams from the SEC perhaps getting into yes. that large bids. Yeah, and, and I think it's going to be uh, – I, I also agree, because even if it's San Diego State over Auburn, uh, that would be a rematch of the national championship game. And, boy, that would be something to see that San Diego State talking about wanting get, revenge. Uh, UConn. UConn. UConn, San Diego UConn. State, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you said Auburn. It, it, no, I, I said if San Diego State upset UConn. Auburn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, so yeah. it would be either way if it's San Diego State or Auburn. Uh, yeah, I think that would be tough. Uh, if they, even be if they a compelling went Final Four matchup. Yep. Very so, compelling. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a, a tough uh, – because I think what happens a lot of times, and you see this in every sport, the, 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 the and, and maybe this is why you've only seen, um, uh, what, the, the two uh, number one seeds that have made the, the, the Final Four. We've talked about this before since 1979. Uh, the number one seed teams to make the Final Four in each tournament – um, it, it was done, uh, if you take a look at it, um, 
uh, if it was done, uh, let's see, none four times. Um, and by the way, that was, I believe, that happened last year? Yeah, right? We didn't have a number one seed make it, did we? In the final four last year? Um, uh, the uh, the fact that the averages is the, that, the only one could have been Connecticut, but they were, I think were number four seed last year. The other three certainly weren't number one seed. Yeah, so uh, thirty five times since nineteen seventy nine, you've had either one or two teams uh, number uh, number one seeds make it. Thirty five, and wow. uh, that means you've only had uh, three number one seeds make it four times, and all four number one seeds only made it once, and that was in two thousand and eight. Yep. So. My point is, is that if you're going to get these teams, you got to get them early before they get on a run. And that's why I think if UConn goes down, I think they do go down against either San Diego State or Auburn. Um, all right. So uh, that's it uh, for that segment. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to hook up with Jim. You know, he's probably experiencing some sort of uh, computer issues. Uh, I'm which... seeing him online right now. Oh, he's back. Okay. Oh, he just went off. Just went off. Oh, now he's back again. As I said now he's that. off again. Okay. All right. We'll all right. While we're here, Greg, uh, in amongst us, let's uh, let's go all the way. Let's see who we're going to okay. have climbing the ladder to cut down the nets. All right. So let's do that. Andy, now you've talked about this, uh, like I, you mentioned on the show just uh, a couple of days ago when we did that prep show. So go right ahead. You said Auburn and Houston would be in the final, but talk about uh, the rest of the final four. Oh, okay. Um and, and, and again, I haven't fully decided on the other two. I do think Creighton makes it out of their division, much to my chagrin, because I have Gonzaga at 120 to 1 to win the tournament. But uh, uh, those odds, I think they were revised to 50 to 1 after the drawings got uh, made. And I played before the win at uh, St. Mary. So I have Creighton making it to the Final Four. The toughest one I have is out in the, um, I guess it would be the uh, West. Uh, Thing. I, I know I don't have North Carolina, and I keep debating back between Arizona and Alabama. And I think of those two, I would go with Alabama versus Arizona. I think Alabama, even though they do have some deficiencies, I think overall they're a stronger team than Arizona. So I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, uh, Creighton. Uh, excuse me, Houston uh, defeating uh, uh, Creighton and uh, Auburn defeating Alabama to make it a uh, Houston Auburn matchup with uh, okay. Auburn winning. And then, by the way, uh, we're going to come back around to end the show with uh, your to give us some uh, long shot futures. You already gave us one, but we're going to uh, do some others just right now based on the odds. Uh, Mark, who do you got for the final four? Uh, my final four, I've got uh, I've got Houston making it to the final four. Uh, I've also got Purdue in the final. Oh, four. Oh, Purdue trying to pull off some of that Virginia magic. And I've got uh, Arizona coming into the Final Arizona. Four. And I've got Iowa State coming into the Final Four. Now, into the matchup between what I would think would be Arizona and Purdue, I'm going to go with Purdue. And what you just mentioned, Greg, is uh, part of the reason. Number one, there are five returning starters back for Purdue who was embarrassed last year, becoming only the second team in NCAA history to lose it to a number 16 seed. So now these kids are back with a mighty big chip on their shoulder here. Uh, and just like Virginia did the first year it ever happened, what did yeah. Virginia do the following year? Yep. They won the whole shebang. And I think this Purdue basketball team is not only deep with experience. I like the job that uh, Matt Painter did in the offseason uh, in the transfer portal. He brought in some sharpshooters uh, to fill in around all this talent that he's got here. So it's not just uh, Zach Eddy in the middle. Uh I think Purdue ends up doing what Virginia did, and they come back and they wipe the mustard off their face and they cut down the nets. Yeah, the only thing uh, – and so you have Purdue beating Arizona. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah, the only thing that uh, – and I don't think Purdue's going to do that, but what I would say is myself, all they have to do is get to the Sweet 16 even, and I'll probably look at them a little bit differently because I think that is going to be important. How do they – not the first round game, of course, but that that second round game when when they have to take on um, who would they take on uh, Utah State even or TCU. I'm not saying that that's going to be a, a major matchup, but I, I want to see how they play in that game. And if they survive that, then uh, you know they may start getting more dangerous because then they'll start getting confident. My my only concern about about uh, Purdue is I'm thinking I'm from Missouri. I lived in Arkansas, so it's close enough. They have to show me. 
three years ago, Purdue was a number 13 seed, lost in the first round, I want to say, to uh, North Texas. The following year, they did win their first round game, uh, but they lost in the second round to uh, a number six seed, which was Texas, and of course last year. So the seniors on this year's team, the five-year players who have been there for a while, have experienced nothing but uh, unanticipated early uh, failure. So you're absolutely right, Greg. If they can make it to the Sweet 16, which they haven't done with uh, this current roster, then I might think of them a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit uh, more seriously. Because remember, after that, after the losses be to uh, to uh, North Texas as a thir- to a 13 seed, they had to face the similar pressure the following year, which they answered by winning their first game, and then they got eliminated. And so last year they were still under pressure, and they lost again to the uh, 16 seed. So uh, I know that the uh, Virginia Purdue comparison we made, but like I say, I got to go see if I have a Missouri license plate, and uh, if they show me by <laughs> making it halfway through the uh, halfway through the championship bracket by winning three of the six, I might think a little bit differently, and probably wouldn't uh, be looking to get involved, but might be looking to play on them during in-game or halftime situations. All right. Uh, so, uh, Jim, are you st- are you not able to chime in yet? Guess not. Um, okay, so unless he's muted, yeah, he he hasn't uh, been able to figure it out. So um, I'll throw in my final four. I only have one uh, top seed in. That's North Carolina. Uh, I am gonna um, and I'm I'm gonna ride San Diego State again. Uh, I think San Diego State is gonna be a dangerous because I'm gonna put one of those Mountain West Conference teams in the final. Um, and so I'm going to do San Diego State. Uh, I think they get their revenge on UConn. Um, all, the thing that I'm troubled with Auburn, and I think Bruce Pearl's great for the sport. Uh, I'd love to see them go on a run. Um, but I just they haven't beaten anybody this year outside their conference. That, 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 that concerns me a little bit. They don't have a superstar on the team. That concerns me a little bit. But we know how deep they are. We know how talented they are. Um, but I think one team from the Mountain West make it a run. Uh, and then I'm taking NC State all the way to the uh, oh. final four. Oh. So that's going to be my long shot team, even though San Diego State's still considered a little bit of a long shot, but not as much as NC State. And Creighton, I'm putting Creighton in because I have to put one of those teams from the Big East because they're, they're, those three teams are really solid. And I, and I think Creighton uh, could be the best of the three. So, um, But I'm going to go ahead and I'll take North Carolina to win it all on my bracket because uh, I'm not going to try to go too crazy, uh, but um, there are those other teams out there that I've mentioned. Who, that, who would they be facing in the Final Four of your Final Four? Uh, would it be a rematch with NC State, or is that a different region? No, that would be a different region, unfortunately. So that would be uh, uh, San Diego State. They'd have to beat San Diego State, okay. uh, and then it would be Creighton over NC State. Um, but, yeah, how crazy would that be? I think that would be great for uh, college basketball to see North Carolina and NC State uh, in the uh, championship game. In a quick rematch. In a quick rematch after NC State beat them. So, um, but yeah. And then, of course, uh, we've talked about all the long shots that I, I think we should keep an eye on. And we're going to get into that right now. By the way, um, I've got three out of the four Final Four teams from Jim. He's given us Connecticut, Houston. Uh, so he's chalked there. But then he's going with your 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 McNeese team, McNeese. I love it. Um, you know, I don't think the uh, NCAA probably would like, or LSU would probably like uh, McNeese in it. That'll bring back some memories with Will yeah, Wade. Will Wade. <laughs> yeah, and uh, North Carolina. So uh, Jim is going to try to accomplish something that hasn't been done very often. Only four times in the history of the tournament has uh, three number one seeds made the Final Four. And uh, Jim believes that it's going to happen this year. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to see who he has to win it. And before uh, I get that, Mark, uh, do you have some futures? You want to lead off with some of the futures you can put some money on? Well, you know, I mentioned the m M&M boys, McNeese and Moorhead. Uh, I think Moorhead, I got to say this, it comes with the disclaimer given the fact that uh, I read where Antonio Brown, the National Football League wide receiver, is all over Moorhead. That's his pick to win this whole thing. So, Oh, no. <laughs> I hate to say that I'm running in the same company as him, but uh, I just that's the disclaimer. Uh, 
By the uh, way, uh, Jim, uh, Jim not only is trying to do something that uh, uh, that hasn't happened very often with three number one seeds getting in, but he's also going to do something that hasn't happened in quite some time, repeating with Connecticut to win oh, the boy. national you're going to repeat with Connecticut. Wow. So uh, by the way, Mark, did you say you'd be running with Antonio Brown? Uh, well, yeah, I, I'm first, afraid. For so. the first 20 yards, maybe. Well, maybe the first five yards, yes. Right. <laughs> Okay. Not very, not very far, right? <laughs> so let's go over the futures now. Matter of fact, I'm going to pop them up on the screen just quickly. Let me go ahead and do that for our viewers. So there's the, the these are the futures. You can see them there. And then uh, once we start getting to you know Baylor's 30, 30 is probably a good number to start with some long shots. If you know with Marquette and Creighton are all 30 to one. Duke, you mentioned Duke, Mark. They're 35 to 1. Um, let's see other teams that you guys have mentioned. Gonzaga, as you said, Adam, uh, they're down to 60 to 1. Uh, let's see. Any, uh, I mentioned San Diego State. They're 90 to 1. Uh, Michigan State, by the way, is 100 to 1. Uh, I think that's a play. I think you gotta you got to do Michigan State at 100 to 1. Um, let's see. FAU is 140 to 1. NC State, 150 to 1. Nevada is 160 to one. Uh, let's see. Any, uh, Drake is 180 to one. Oregon's 200 to one. McNeese is 300 to one. Grand Canyon's 300 to one. And I oh, and Moorhead is a thousand to one. A thousand to one. As well, they should be. So there you go. Those are all the odds. The future. They just. I, I heard they just went down the 500 to one. Jim Feist just made a play. Is what I heard. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> He's been busy. Hey, wait, I hear a laugh. That sounds like Jim. Oh, the laugh's back and Jim's back. All well, right. if you'd like San Diego State uh, to get back there and you're looking at all these shoots, I think in that same realm, that same way of thinking, you have to look at Florida Atlantic. This is a basketball team that uh, did it last year, much like San Diego State did. They got everybody back this year, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, talent. And what are they, 200 to 1 you mentioned, Greg? FAU? Florida, yeah. Yes. Uh, F uh, 140 to one, 140 to one. Yeah. Well, if, if Connecticut trips up, maybe it might happen at that juncture. Who knows? Well, again, that's to win it all. So yep. yeah. And, and the only thing that stinks about when you get these long shots is you're like, well, I can hedge my bet, but you really can't. The only way you can no, hedge your going to be underdogs. Yeah. The Take only way on underdogs. Yeah. The only way you can hedge your bet is, is if they hopefully get off to a lead in the game. In game. Yeah, in game yep. betting. In yep, game that's the only game. way. All right, Mark, come on, give us uh give us some nice uh long shots to win it all. Well, what was what was wrong with the uh, M and M boys in FAU? Oh McNeese. So <laughs> so uh McNeese is three hundred to one, so you're gonna go with McNeese. And FAU, you're gonna take FAU at hundred and forty to one? Okay. Yes. Well, those are really big long shots. Wow. And well, we're talking gonna, uh, uh, we're talking 100 to 1 guys that we're talking, no? Well, you can do anything. Yeah, you could take those. I think there are two categories. One, you got those 100 to 1 shots, and the other ones, those 30 to 1 shots or more. So those are your two, like, 100 to 1 long shots. Would you Would you, Would you? you go with Duke at 35 to 1? As yes, a, I would. Okay. Yes. All right. So we'll put Duke down with McNeese and FAU. So those are Mark's top three long shots. Andy? I would throw something in on McNeese because they actually, I do a, an analysis where I evaluate statistically a number of key factors that I look at. And I give them a weighted average, like I'll give more to some categories than others. And McNeese rates highly across the board. In fact, they're in my top five overall. Now, obviously, the competition that they've acquired, that they've accumulated against. But at 300 to 1, they're worth a small little uh, wager. Of, of medium-sized long shots, I would, uh, well, I already have Marquette. At a number slightly better than the thirty to one that you mentioned. All right, you got and thirty Gonzaga, to one here. Okay. Yeah, and Gonzaga at a number that's much better than what you mentioned. I think they're fifty or sixty to one. You got sixty to on, one uh, here. What you have there. So I already have those. So if I'm looking at something in between those, I think Florida Atlantic uh, works very nicely again because they would be facing Connecticut, and uh, they at least watched them last year, uh, scouting them for a potential uh, matchup uh, in. Uh, the uh, championship game last year, um, uh, or, did, or, did, or were they? No, they were eliminated by Florida Atlantic last year in the game. So there's some familiarity in the in the final four games. So there's some familiarity there. Those are attractive 
odds. And uh, another one that I like, I also like Moorhead as far as uh, uh, their possibility of doing some damage in that tournament because they 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 match up well against a number of different styles of teams. Well, you're again, just running with Antonio Brown is what you're doing, Andy. Running with both of you. Yes. Okay. So so Andy's going with uh, a 30, a 60, a 140, a 300, and a thousand to one shot to win the national championship. Yeah, and, right. and a 16 to one Auburn, which is the one that I picked to win it all. Yeah, that, that, that's still that, decent odds. Well, yeah, long sure. Shot. That's that's legitimate. Although again, roll it over. Start with the hundred and roll it over, and you'll probably do better than that because they'll be. Well, they would be underdog. Well, I you know I can't say that they would be. Sixteen to one might actually not be not bad because again they ranked very highly, so they might actually be favored against some of the teams they might meet uh, in the yeah, uh, it would be favorite mm -hmm. rounds past them. Maybe uh, the only team they you know maybe the only teams they wouldn't be favored would, would be uh, Purdue uh, and Houston if both of those teams reached the final four. All right, now that Jim's back, it's a it's a long shot time for Jim Feist. What do you got? Give us some long shots, Jim. Well, I got to start with McNeese because I have him in the final four. I so, love the McNeese. You guys, uh, are, you guys are great. You go there, it's, it, you know. It's I'm going to make some out. money this tournament. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, but by the way, Jim, if you're going to play McNeese. How about trying the rollover money uh, money line thing with McNeese starting with the first <laughs> round game? <laughs> Your three hundred to one could be twelve hundred to one by the time it's over. You know, maybe if I put a five hundred dollars on McNeese to win it all, I'm just on the Where are you going? And then I then I go with the rollover at fifty bucks a shot. There you go. You know, you have a little Collect bit twice. Of, you get, you know, you get then you're really that's a hell of a price there. The rollover. All right. So, what else? What else besides McNeese? Uh, what do you got, Jim? Okay. Um, well, I do like I, I do like this Duke team. I think they can they can do a lot. There, you're talking about they're not a monster sure long shot, but they're a long shot enough. Um, I mean, they definitely could win their first two games. They could easily win. They can then go possibly going against Houston. I mean, they can get there. They can do it. Um, Tough team, tough conference. I agree. Um, yeah, now that they've lost uh, early in their tournament. Oh, by the way, no, they didn't. They won a tournament game, didn't they? Remember that uh, trend? Um, oh, Kansas, which, which team? And they won't win, right? Yeah, the team ever won the tournament that didn't win a conference tournament game? Yes. Uh, yes. Let me see if I got exactly what it is. Did they, win, did they win a game or not? Let's see. Um, it's here somewhere. I'm pretty but sure they did. I think Kansas lost their first game, right? Well, they, yeah, Not that anybody's going. picking Kansas now. So. No, everybody, they've been going bad for a while. Which which team are you thinking about now? Team that lost? The Duke. That did yeah. not win a con Duke. Duke. Well, one of the years they won it? Well, yeah, no, because no, con no team has ever won a national championship after losing their first conference tournament game. Didn't matter where it was. If it's their first no. game in a conference tournament, they lose it. They've never, never won a national championship. So did Duke lose their first game? Did you guys uh, uh, look that up? Oh, you mean this year? Yeah, in the ACC tournament. I don't believe they lost. Because they lost to who in the in the, in the, in the tournament? Who did they lose to? NC State, right? Was it NC State? No, I, yeah, was it? Who, who did... Uh, Duke lose to in the let's see Duke uh, NC State beat Virginia yep. and then uh, North Carolina did they beat Duke? I'll have to look that up. Let me look that up. All right, Duke so Duke in the ACC did lose their first uh, uh, game. Their, their last regular season game was when they uh, lost to North Carolina, and then their first conference game was uh, NC State on the 14th. They lost by five. It was NC State. Okay, there you go. So they would be. But hey, the way things are going right now, uh, I mean, Jim's got all sorts of uh, trend breakers uh, with three number one seeds in the tournament, with a back to back champion winning the tournament. Why put not McNeese put Duke in, the in there? Four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, put put Duke in there to break that trend. The first team ever to win their first conference yeah, tournament the game. Old, the only constant is change, right? Uh, absolutely. Well, for Especially if you live long enough. 
for 40 something years, a number 16 had never beaten a number one. Now it's happened twice in six years. There you go. So, there you go. Nothing can last forever. All right. So, is that it, Jim? That's your, you got the big one, McNeese State, and then you have the average one in Duke. Any, any well, others? Could, you know, I said a couple of weeks ago when we did this that there are probably between 25 and 35 teams that could win this. Absolutely. And, 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 the old, and so, when you're talking about long shots, there's four number one seeds. Everybody else is a long shot. Yeah, I don't so, know about that. You know, so it, it's, yeah, they're number twos. Let's take out the ones and the twos and the threes and the fours. How many teams are above that, is, which is what we did before, anything above the four? Yeah, there's lots of teams that can do that. I mean, well, you what would you put your money on? Your money. <laughs> which, which I do all the time. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, don't be telling us next week. Oh yeah, I had uh, I had the, them. They're looking pretty good right now. Well, you didn't say that last week, Jim. Yeah, but I don't bet. I'm not that big of a future player. I mean, I have some. Yeah, futures. you don't put that in too I'm much. A, I'm a I'm a per game guy. You know, okay. it's like um, like I well, got you got, got two over, of them. I have U, UAB plus the points over over San Diego State. Um, I have uh, BYU. No, I don't. Um, so, so you've already got, you already have some money line plays in the first round. Uh, most mostly points spread because oh. these are dogs. Do you have any um, money line plays? Um, let me look down the. Yeah, sheet look here. at that. I'll give my final four. I mean, my four because I actually have one long shot per region. I'm going to go with Creighton thirty to one. I'm going to go with San Diego State ninety to one. Michigan State a hundred to one. And North Carolina State, 150 to 1. I was just going to mention that if you go with coaches, Michigan State, 100 to 1, is really good under Tom Izzo. I mean, are there any better coaches than uh, Tom Izzo? Not too many. He 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 made them maybe some equal. How has he done the last three years? Uh, Don't have that in front of me. I don't think I don't think he's the same guy he was a while ago. Nobody. And if you and if you go (laughs) with experience, with good solid experience as coaches. Gonzaga with Mark Few. It's been 20 something oh, yeah, years absolutely. Uh, that we've made the tournament. So, yeah, yeah and, they're, and they're attractively priced right now as well. So, if you play the coaches and or experience angle, those two, oh, look, Michigan State, what, they're second, I think, only to Kansas in the number of consecutive tournaments that they've been in. 20 something. Yeah, after you, after you talked about this a couple of weeks ago, I mean, I put money on Gonzaga at 70 to 1. I didn't have to get you 120 to 1, but 70 to 1, which is pretty much what they are right now almost, is still a great number for a program yeah, that was, like that was Gonzaga. Probably right after, that was probably right after they beat St. Mary's and maybe even after they lost to St. Mary's in the conference tournament, but before the brackets were known. All right. So, did, did you have well, it? You talked about who I bet. Yes. Long Beach. These are dogs, so I'm not really playing money lines with these big dogs. But I got Long Beach plus the 21 and a half. Um Hold on a second here. Yeah, but you act and but, well, I think the ones that make sense though are the fact are the questions that we asked uh, at the beginning, and and you 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 did uh, uh, you did pick you said you you like both St. Peter's and Long Beach State as a potential definitely yeah so Def- definitely potentials. What are those money lines right now? Yeah, they're not well. They got to be. I bet them. That I'm taking the points because it's, sure. I'm not betting the money line on St. Peter's. The they got to be at least three digits, at least 100 to one, probably probably larger on both of on right. Both if of you bet a futures bet, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. So we're talking about straight bets, money line bets, and we're talking about future bets. There's lots of, lots of bets. And we've got the link, of course, in the description for everybody to check out. Uh, it'll show you uh, how to check out uh, the uh, packages that are available at Playbook. Uh, sports.com for Jim, uh, for Mark, and then, of course, the um, Logical Approach uh, website link. Everything's in the description area. I know sometimes it's kind of weird. That's the one thing. Uh, some people who aren't familiar with YouTube don't know that they're supposed to click the little more button, and then everything pops up, uh, things that they've never seen before. So you just have to click the little more button, and you'll see all the links that we have available for everybody for all these packages uh, over at playbooksports.com. And Andy, what do you got going on, by the way, right now f- for anybody that wants to check out what you have put together? Well, I, I still have up uh, a link for what we have for uh, the balance of the NBA NHL seasons, as well as uh, the up 
well, it's still upcoming, although underway NCAA tournament and uh, getting set to do something with baseball, which started last night. And if you were up at 3 a.m. in the morning, you got to watch the Dodgers come from behind to not only win, but cover the run line in their 5-2 win in Korea over the San Diego Padres. And I would imagine that the Dodgers are going to be so heavily bet this year, you not only won't see them as an underdog all too often, if at all, you'll probably have to lay a price to lay the run and a half with them. That's how potent that lineup is. The pitching, a little concern there, but this is a very strong team, and uh, they're all in this year. And I think they're still about plus 320 or so to win the World Series, but... Uh, Atlanta figures to give them a nice little run. How many championships have the Dodgers won, like, in the last 10 years? Very few. That won the other uh, shortened season against uh, – Is that the only the one? Because... I think that was the COVID season against Houston. Yeah, th- just so everybody out there I knows think it was, this, yeah. in case you didn't I mean, know Roberts, it. Roberts and I know... is a money burner, he, he, this guy. I mean, he, with all his talent, they should win every year, but they yeah. don't. I think the last time they had won prior to the COVID season was 1988. Well – Everybody outside of LA, I know we. Ch- I know you probably think differently, but sorry, that that season doesn't count. If anybody thinks that that actually is going to count for the annals of baseball, where everybody knows baseball is the sport of how going through 162 games, it, that's the whole purpose of being a championship baseball team, not cutting the season in short. So you could sell. I mean, they celebrated and they had fun, but it's not a World Series championship. Well, if we're around 100 years from now, we can talk. <laughs> well, guys, let's talk about this next week. What do you say? Yes, take let's do up, that right? because it's going to take about eight hours for this two-hour show to upload. But all right, yeah, so I'll let that, you close put, it out, Mark. Let's put the final wraps in the show. Uh, we're going to be back next week with our Sweet Sixteen podcast, where we'll all get back together again and look at what's happened and what will happen in the NCAA basketball tournament. For our co-host. Oh, by Andy the way, is- I don't know if we yes. mentioned it, but we'll have a link in the description too uh, for obviously the, the your uh, March Madness newsletter. Oh, cool! Yes, right. So yeah, that's that's available now at PlaybookSports.com. Yeah. Really, a kind don't, of a- don't make a bet or a decision without it. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Definitely not. A lot of a lot of good stuff in there, guys. I got to say, uh, I'll attest to it. I worked uh, Sunday, Monday night. That's why Mark. That's oh. why Mark doesn't give any sleep. Till 4 a.m. Yes, I did. That's why he was actually watching the baseball game last night. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, he he had had already sent the newsletter out, I believe, by the time that game started. Mark was sleeping, probably. Yes, deservedly so. (laughs) Yeah, but I'll be fresher next week, guys. I promise you. uh, For Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Jim Feist, the legend himself in Las Vegas, and also Tony Mejia, who was. With uh, out of services today, our co host Greg De Palma from Prime Sports Network. This is Mark Lawrence. Until next week, once again, reminding you to always to remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.